Thanks for listening to another life-transforming message from the team here at C3 Southwest Washington. To find out more about our church, visit c3swwa.com. Good morning, friends and family. Grab your Bible. Let's take a look at Mark chapter 11. Today is Palm Sunday, and I know for many of you, this is the greatest staycation ever imposed upon you in the history of man. You're getting ahead on projects, taking care of some honeydews. In this season, you're really doing well. For others of you, this season has been incredibly difficult. Coronavirus has brought some things up. You might be unsure where your next paycheck is coming from, or you might even be concerned about your health or health of a family member. Regardless, we know the Word of God to be effective, to speak to us no matter what season we're in, no matter what situation, and it's my prayer that today's message will help you. As we look at Mark chapter 11, we discover Jesus about to ride into Jerusalem. It says there, they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on it. He sat on it and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Many of us would be familiar with the word Hosanna, but we might not be quite sure exactly what it means. It's actually of Hebrew origin, and it's always uttered as a prayer, asking God to save. And it's fascinating that this was proclaimed to Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem, a prayer directed at a man, yet inviting him to save. Jesus, save. Jesus, save. Hosanna. The people of Jerusalem were experiencing a difficult political time. All of Israel was under the rule and reign of Caesar and the entire Roman Empire. In shouting Hosanna, they were actually asking Jesus to rescue them from the Roman Empire. In my lifetime, I've been able to observe some pretty radical situations requiring rescue. In October 1987, an 18-month-old toddler fell into an abandoned well at her aunt's home in Midland, Texas. Jessica McClure, or baby Jessica, became trapped in a well shaft 22 feet underground. Rescuers finally decided to dig a shaft next to the existing one and tunnel sideways through into her shaft. After two and a half days, she was finally rescued with only minor scrapes and bruises. In August 2010, 33 workers were trapped in an underground copper mine in the nation of Chile. Rescuers dug a borehole all the way into the shaft to communicate with these men directly. And it took the following 68 days as rescuers bored through thousands of tons of stone and rubble until finally every last man was rescued. In July 2018, we watched as 12 students and their soccer coach went for a walk in Thailand only to find themselves in a series of caves. As they explored the underground, a flash flood suddenly overcame them, trapping them in one of the caves. It took rescuers like NASA and Navy SEAL divers 18 days to rescue the young man, but every last one was rescued. Every last one was saved. Today, I believe that all of us stand at a similar moment. Everyone everywhere at this exact same moment needs to be rescued from the exact same thing, coronavirus. And here's the good news. Hosanna, Jesus saves. It's likely that every one of us has come across one of those vintage bumper stickers or a sign on the side of the road that makes that declaration, Jesus saves. In 1990, Dr. Gene Scott moved his Sunday services into the United Artists Building, which was later renamed the Los Angeles University Cathedral. And Scott erected two Jesus saves neon signs below the roof and the building became a curiosity for passers-by. All across America and around the world, similar signs can be seen and found, sometimes loud, sometimes subtle, but the reminder is there. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And yet, it's often misunderstood. The first time I saw one of those signs, I was a young boy watching a football game And in the end zone, right next to a John 3.16 poster, was another man holding a sign that said, Jesus saves. And I remember looking at that sign, wondering, why does he have a sign that says Jesus saves at a football game in the end zone? Why is the camera even showing that on TV? And what does he even mean? My confusion was not unlike the confusion of the people in Jerusalem shouting, Jesus save, Jesus save, Hosanna. They were looking for a political savior, 
not realizing they needed so much more. As they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, save, save. Jesus didn't turn towards City Hall as they expected. Instead, he turned the opposite direction towards the temple. The understood epicenter of where God's presence resided and the same epicenter from which all life flowed. Jesus knew that if he was going to save man, it had to be more than just politically. After all, governments can help, but they cannot save completely, thoroughly, and certainly not eternally. Only God can do that. When their expectations weren't fulfilled, the crowd began to disperse and very few people followed Jesus to the temple. As Jesus and his disciples left the city that day, they ventured into a time of preparation. Jesus was about to gather the greatest ransom ever to save all of mankind from every generation out of every situation they've ever experienced. Jesus led his disciples in the final meal where they shared communion. From there, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed intensely for you and I. It was there that guards took him to a mock trial in the city led by religious leaders condemning him to death. From there, he was transferred to political leaders and ended up in the house of Pontius Pilate. Pilate did not want to condemn Jesus on the evidence provided, but he decided to ask the exact same crowd who was shouting Hosanna, and their response was, crucify, crucify, crucify. From there, Pilate gave the command for Jesus to be led out of the city to the hill called Golgotha, where he was crucified. After hours of hanging on the cross, he breathed his last and he said, it is finished. Hours later, a wealthy man gathered the body of Christ and prepared him for burial, placing him in his own family tomb. And for the next three days, Jesus' lifeless body was there. Every one of these actions are the actions of a savior, one who is gathering the ransom necessary to rescue us from every situation we'll ever face in this lifetime, every person ever born, every circumstance they've ever found themselves in, every moment that we've needed to be rescued, Jesus paid the ransom so that we could be saved. The people of Jerusalem didn't understand what Hosanna meant. And truthfully, there was a time in my life when I didn't either. For years, all I needed was a small S savior. I needed to be saved from getting in trouble, from getting caught, from being found out, from the most recent scrape I found myself in, from the conflict I had created, from another bad grade or a failed test. My situations required only small rescues, savior with a small S. But then after high school, something radically shifted. I began to attend a local college while most of my friends had gone away to school. I found myself somewhat lonely, I had very little time because I was working two part-time jobs. I began to get tired and discouraged. My girlfriend broke up with me, and later on I came down with mono. After a few weeks of being sick, I began to fall behind in my classes. I started to feel overwhelmed. I started doing stupid things. I found myself at parties that I didn't even want to be at, doing things that were ridiculous. One day in the mail, I received a notice from the school letting me know I was on academic probation. I had failed two of my four classes. Everything I had been looking forward to as an adult, now up close, seemed extremely hollow. My car was a money pit. Every time I turned around, it was 200 more dollars. I just couldn't seem to get ahead. One night on a dark country road, headed to a party with my best friend. I was driving recklessly, showing off, passing cars on curves. I lost control of my vehicle and put it into a tree. I have no idea how much time passed, but the first thing I realized, paramedics were standing over me. As I looked off in the distance, I could see them working to get my best friend out of the vehicle. I was afraid, but I asked the question, is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? The answer was no, but for the very first time, I realized how dangerously close I was to that thin, thin veil that separates life from death. I had almost sent someone across that line and I had almost crossed it myself. In the following days, for the first time ever, I felt like somebody who needed a savior. I knew I needed to be saved emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, academically, theoretically and practically, spiritually, past, present and future. I didn't just need to be saved, I needed a savior. Not long after that, I found myself approaching God and very simply I said, Lord, be my savior. And it all began. Jesus saves. When you read the Bible, you discover that Jesus saves people from almost 
everything and anything. At the beginning of his ministry, there was a young couple getting married, and during the after party, they, they ran out of wine. Jesus saved them from embarrassment, and he turned the water into wine. He saved the son of a politician who was close to death from a fever. He saved some struggling fishermen by causing fish to enter their nets and overflowing their boats. He saved hundreds of people afflicted and tormented by demonic activity. He saved Peter's mother-in-law from a fever. He saved multiple people from the coronavirus of their day. Leprosy. They were healed instantly. Jesus rescued them. He saved a military commander's favorite servant from death one day. And he saved the day for a single mom whose son passed away by rescuing him from death. In fact, Jesus raised several people from the dead. One night on a lake, he saved everyone in a boat from being capsized by speaking to the storm and telling it to be silent. There's quite a few people that Jesus saved from paralysis and gave them full mobility in their bodies. Jesus saved a young woman one day from a crowd that was about to kill her. They caught her in the act of sin, a sin that some of them were also guilty of. Jesus saved a man who had a withered hand and restored it like new. Jesus saved the hearing of a number of people who were deaf, the sight of many who were blind, and the ability to speak for many that were mute. Jesus even reattached the ear of a man who had his chopped off. Jesus even saved a man who did not have the money to pay his taxes. He directed the man to go fishing, and there in the mouth of the fish he caught was the payment for the man's tax bill. There's hardly a situation, circumstance, or scenario that Jesus isn't willing to get involved with and save. He is a savior, capital S. In the few moments we have remaining, I want you to consider this. Jesus saves. He saves from the external, the internal, and the eternal. First, Jesus saves from the external. The things that we go through, the things that we come up against, the things that we experience in life, things like coronavirus, Jesus can save. And there will be the next coronavirus and the next because the Bible lets us know that in this world we will have trouble. But Jesus reminds us that he's overcome the world. He can save through the coronaviruses that he faces. Jesus also saves us from the internal, things that live within us that others can't see, and quite honestly, sometimes we are unable to see, and yet pose very real threats to the life that God has for us. He can save us from poor decisions, from a lack of wisdom or knowledge, from the brokenness that drives us to make poor choices that happened when we were children or yesterday. He can save us from wrong thinking, that we think is completely right. He can save us from insecurities that cause us to act or react in ways that make no sense at all, that actually sabotage our future. He can save us from the unforgiveness that not only breaks relationships, but like a cancer, eats us from within, robbing us of joy and hope. He can save us in those moments when we decide to sin. Though we know it's sin, somehow we justify in our minds that this is going to be okay, that somehow we deserve to do this. Jesus is able to save us from the things that would steal, kill, and destroy because ultimately he has come to give us life and life more abundantly. And finally, Jesus saves eternally. It's not often that we think about that concept especially when we don't feel like we really need a capital S savior. But I'm confident that during this season, most people have been contemplating what would happen if I got sick, if I died. And it's then, especially, that you can know that Jesus saves. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, let us know we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I don't know about you, but I know some of the things that are recorded in my book. Even my most righteous actions are tainted with an element of unrighteousness. The thought of standing before God in judgment for all of those actions, I desperately need a savior. But that is why Jesus came to this earth, to save us, especially in that moment. Christ gave his life for us so that we could be saved. It's my hope today that you've come to the place where you don't need a small s savior, a small s rescue. It's my hope that you've come to the place where you need a capital S savior. And that is exactly who Jesus wants to be to you. I love Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost 
those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is able to save to the uttermost everyone who draws near to him. For those of you who have never drawn near to God, I'm going to invite you to take your first step today and pray. Right now, we're going to receive communion as families in our homes, together online. I want to remind you that the bread and juice represent the steep ransom already paid so that you and I can be rescued, so that we can be saved. If you've never received Christ as Savior, I'm going to invite you to pray with me in just a moment and step into that relationship with God. For those of you who already have him as Savior, but maybe you're looking at your future, you're concerned about your paycheck, about your health, about your family, I want you to lean in, receive communion, and be reminded that Jesus saves. Together, let's pray. Father, I thank you for each one. I thank you for the communion we're about to receive. And I thank you, you long to be Savior. Jesus, you save externally, internally, and eternally. We lean into that relationship and ask you to save, to save, to save. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, leaders, and what we do at C3 Church, visit our website at c3swwa.com.